welcome to a presentation on the role of climate change in 17th century psalms. I'm Dr. David Weed, coordinator of the Psalms Heritage Area Project, and I'll be your host for this talk. While we know that America had been occupied long before the arrival of Europeans, there is no written record of the climate. Archaeological evidence gives us some clues of global climate, but no detailed history of weather in America. The Poconoca people had occupied New England for 10,000 years before Europeans began arriving, but they kept no records of their weather. Their clans occupied Psalms, or the southern area of what is today all of East Bay, Rhode Island, and nearby Massachusetts, that was known to have a more favorable climate than the rest of New England. During the 17th century, thousands of people from England decided to leave their home in the North Atlantic to settle in this region. While we know a lot about their journey, do we also know about the weather they encountered when they arrived? From their written records, there's ample information about the weather. We know that the pilgrims encountered a brutal winter and half of them died during that first winter. But was that weather typical of the time? Was it what they expected to find? During the heart of the period known as the Little Ice Age during the 17th century, temperatures were extremely low in much of Europe and what would become the eastern United States. Dutch masterpieces from that time by Bruegel, Van de Neer, and others show people skating on canals and rivers that almost never freeze today. Ice was so prevalent in the northern seas that Inuit were seen fishing as far south as Scotland. In Europe, glaciers descended from the Alps, destroying outlying farms and threatening to crush whole villages. In North America, native tribes banded together to form the League of the Iroquois in the face of declining food supply and other natural hardships during these cold years. It has long been speculated that the drop in temperatures was due to a dimmer sun. After Galileo's popularization of the telescope in 1609, he and several other early astronomers soon observed and studied dark spots on the sun. These sunspots cycled over a period of about 11 years as they do today. But after 1645, prominent sunspots almost totally vanished. They reappeared about 1715 and the sunspot cycle has been present ever since. The decades with almost no sunspots is now called the Maunder minimum. Modern measurements have confirmed the early assumption that the number of sunspots is related to the total brightness of the sun. A reduction in the amount of sunlight reaching the planet leads to a weaker equator to pole heating difference and therefore slower winds. The effect on surface temperatures is particularly large in winter. The diminished flow creates a cold land warm ocean pattern by reducing the transport of warm oceanic air to the continents and vice versa. These results begin to reconcile the long-standing dilemma of how the change in solar output could have been very small and yet have led to much colder temperatures in Europe and eastern North America, the areas from which the historical evidence for the Little Ice Age originates. The Little Ice Age changed New England history in ways that historians are only beginning to understand. Though scientists don't agree on what caused the Little Ice Age, most agree the climate cooled from the 15th century to the middle of the 19th century with the greatest intensity between 1550 and 1700. Some scientists peg the coldest period even more narrowly between 1645 and 1715. During that period, the average winter temperatures in North America fell two degrees Celsius. 
The term Little Ice Age is somewhat questionable because there was no single well-defined period of prolonged cold. There were two phases of the Little Ice Age, the first beginning around 1290 and continuing until the late 1400s. There was a slightly warmer period in the 1500s after which the climate deteriorated substantially with the coldest period between 1645 and 1715. Whatever the cause or causes of the Little Ice Age, scientists and historians agree on its effects. Unusually wet springs that caused flooding, hot and dry summers that led to droughts, and particularly cold winters. Historian Jeffrey Parker has written extensively about the worldwide influence of this change in climate, on war, famine, and other major catastrophes. Two other books also explore the connection between the Little Ice Age and historical events in Europe and North America. In fact, there is substantial historical evidence for the Little Ice Age. The Baltic Sea froze over, as did many of the rivers and lakes in Europe. Pack ice extended far south into the Atlantic, making shipping to Iceland and Greenland impossible for months on end. Winters were bitterly cold and summers were often cool and wet. These conditions led to widespread crop failure, famine, and population decline. The tree line and snow line dropped and glaciers advanced, overrunning towns and farms in the process. There were increased levels of social unrest as large portions of the population were reduced to starvation and poverty. The prices of grain increased and wine became difficult to produce in many areas and commercial vineyards vanished in England. Fishing in northern Europe was also badly affected as cod migrated south to find warmer water. Storminess and flooding increased and in mountainous regions the tree line and snow line dropped. Regions that diversified ag agriculture and had good access to the international trade network like Britain and the Low Countries could cope quite easily with increasingly severe weather conditions. They could import food when harvest failed. Trade also gave them the financial base to develop technological responses. New England, whose latitude is the low 40s, was expected to have the climate of Spain or southern France, so people wanted to go there to escape the cold. The debilitating effect of excessive summer heat on English character was the promoter's main fear in the early years. What they found, of course, was that New England was in fact very hot in summer, but that it was also extremely cold, much colder than England in winter. The Plymouth colonists wrote little about their early experiences of the weather. They complained about the first winter, but this was apparently one in which the late November, early December weather was hard and the rest of the winter mild and rainy. The summer of 1623, saw a long and nearly disastrous drought, which was ended by a day of prayer and humiliation. William Wood of Massachusetts Bay repeated Indian lore that every 10 years there's no real winter. To confirm this, he pointed to the winter of 1620-21, no winter in comparison, and the winter of 1629-30, which he said was a very m mild season, little frost, and less snow, but clear, serene weather. Therefore, Wood argued the winter, though sharp, was not too long to bear. At first, Wood was trying to promote settlement in New England, but later Wood also wrote that the June of 1637 was so hot that newcomers died of the heat and Winthrop was forced to travel at night. He wrote that this hot summer was followed by the very hard winter of 1637-38, in which the snow lay up to three feet deep from mid-November until early April. John Winthrop also reported the winter cold was unprecedented in the Indians' experience, and he stressed that not only was Massachusetts Bay frozen out to sea so far as one can well discern, and so thick that 
Horses and carts went over in many places where ships have sailed. But Chesapeake Bay in the south was similarly ice covered. The season of 1645-46 was another landmark hard winter, the earliest and sharpest winter that we have since our arrival in the country, according to Winthrop. As in 1642, he stressed that the extraordinary cold was felt to the south as well. The sudden onset of spring caused great floods and the summer crops were attacked by swarms of caterpillars, which Winthrop thought were a quasi-meteorological phenomenon as they had fallen, according to diverse good observers, in a great thunder shower. The American climate also presented an extreme intellectual challenge, one that colonists were quick to take up. The problem, simply stated, is that New England should have not been so cold. London is north of 50 degrees latitude. New England lies between 40 and 45 degrees. Common sense told settlers that New England, being closer to the sun, by which they meant nearer the equator, must be warmer winter and summer than England. When they were forced to face conclusive evidence that New England was actually colder in winter than England, the possibility loomed that America was fundamentally defective. What they didn't know was that the Gulf Stream was keeping England and Northern Europe warm. Some people in the early decades believed the American climate was already changing as a result of cultivation by Europeans. William Wood thought he saw evidence as early as 1634 that rainfall patterns were changing, and he argued that New England's weather was as England's had formerly been. Wood reported Indian testimony that the weather was better since the arrival of the English, the times and seasons being much altered in seven or eight years freer from lightning and thunder, long droughts, sudden and tempestuous dashes of rain, and lamentable cold winters. In 1654, Edward Johnson wrote that cutting down the woods and breaking up the land for agriculture had caused a marked change in the very nature of the seasons, moderating the winter's cold of late very much. Elsewhere, he also argued that the summers were becoming more temperate. But with the apparent end of the extreme cold that the earliest settlers had known, it is easy to see how New Englanders, such as Edward Johnson, could believe that European occupation of the land was changing the climate for the better. Johnson claimed more than the breaking of one dry spell he argued that God was changing the fundamental climate of New England in order to make it hospitable to his colonists. This sense of accomplishment in changing the climate ended in the 1680s and 90s as New England along with Northern Europe was plunged into the worst decades of the Little Ice Age. The winter of 1680-81 was said by Increase Mather to have been the coldest for 40 years. The winter of 1684-85 was very cold, with Boston Harbor frozen so hard that 900 people went to Castle Island and back on the ice. The winter of 1685-86 proved even colder. The harsh 1630s and harsher 1640s were followed by more temperate and controlled 1650s and 1660s. Much of the 1670s was also moderate. Extremely harsh winters during the Little Ice Age destroyed the first colony in what is now Maine and delayed colonization in New England for a good 10 years. A group of English investors called the Plymouth Company chartered by the Popham Colony, also known as the Sagador Colony in coastal Maine, had two ships carrying 120 settlers who set sail on May 1607 under the leadership of George Popham. Popham's death in the winter of 1607, however, described as extreme, unseasonable, and frosty, drove the colonists back to England. 
Sir Fernando George, one of the investors, recalled in 1622, all our former hopes were frozen to death. As a result, English interest in colonizing New England disappeared for a decade. Explorer John Smith expressed a view of New England as a cold, barren, mountainous, rocky desert. The French failed to colonize, too, on the island of St. Croix in the middle of the river that divides Canada from the United States. Seventy-nine men arrived in the summer of 1604 and thought they found a paradise with warm weather, good soil, and plenty of fish and game. Then it began to snow on October 6, beginning a long and sharply cold winter. Thirty-five men died of a hideous, mysterious disease, probably scurvy, and when spring finally arrived, they moved to what is now Annapolis, Nova Scotia. Had the weather not been so severe, New England might be New France today. No one had ever seen anything like the great colonial hurricane of 1635. It blew down houses and forests and flattened all the corn to the ground, which never rose more. An extremely harsh winter followed the hurricane, which caused the crops to fail. The English settlers coming to New England then competed intensely for corn. In August of 1636, a group of colonists from Connecticut seized Indian corn. The Pequot counterattack escalated into the Pequot War, argues historian Geoffrey Parker in Global Crisis, War, Climate Change, and Catastrophe in the 17th Century. The James and the Angel were slower and crossed together for most of the trip. During early July, they parted company with the James moving somewhat faster. Both arrived as the hurricane was raging. However, both ships had to wait out the storm off the coast. The Angel Gabriel was able to send most of its passengers ashore at Pemaquid in Maine, and they slept as guests of the villagers already living there while their ship rested at anchor in the harbor. By morning, the storm tore the Angel Gabriel from its anchor and reduced it to rubble. The several crew and passengers who stayed on board were lost, and the remaining passengers were left to recover what they could of their belongings from the surf. Droughts were the greater problem in America. When Jesuit missionaries, led by the Virginia Indian Don Luis Velasco arrived on the James River in the autumn of 1570, they encountered dry conditions and hunger. When Thomas Harriet, John White, and the other English colonists landed at Roanoke in 1585, they found a land in the midst of unprecedented drought. The years 1587, 88, and 89 were the driest in the previous 800. The corn began to wither, Harriet wrote, and the Indians worried that the drought was somehow connected to the arrival of the English. Conditions were just as bad when the English sailed into Chesapeake Bay in 1670. Tree ring studies conducted by the scientists from the University of Arkansas who examined a bald cypress near Jamestown discovered that the colonists arrived at the beginning of a seven-year drought, the driest period, in 770 years. The winter in Virginia was no less severe. John Smith wrote of a cold so miserable that a dog would scarcely have endured it. The colonist Francis Perkins, writing to a friend in England on March 28, 1608, described a cold so intense that one night the river our fort froze almost all the way across although at that point it is as wide again as the one at London. The ice in the river froze some fish, which when we took them out after the ice was melted, were very good. Historians argue the Little Ice Age also created the conditions for King Philip's War 40 years later. The cooler climate reduced crop yield, so the colonists demanded more and more land. Metacomet or King Philip had to surrender some of his land in lieu of a fine levied by the Massachusetts General Court in 1671. Philip forged alliances with other tribes and built forts 
until he launched his attack on English settlers in 1675. Unfortunately for Metacomet, the unusually cold winter of 1675-76 caused many of his people to starve. It also led to one of the Indians' worst defeats in the war. The swamps that usually protected a Narragansett fort froze during the winter. That allowed Benjamin Church and his men to massacre the inhabitants. Colder weather suits the Anopheles or malaria mosquito, which the Europeans may have spread among the Indian population. Whatever the cause, Thomas Harriet observed that within a few days after our departure from every such town about 20, in some 40, and one six score people would die, which in truth was very many in respect of their numbers. The colonists defeated the Indians. As much as a thousand Indians were sold into slavery and 5,000 were killed in battle or died of sickness or starvation. Another 2,000 fled west or north. Plymouth Colony lost 8% of its adult male population in the war and per capita income among the colonists in New England didn't recover for a century. Climate, therefore, was not neutral in war or in peacetime.